Hey, everybody, welcome back to Practical Liberty. My name's Henry Bingaman. Uh, if you've been following me for a while, you know that one of the things I talk about is uh, freelancing a lot because I believe the uh, the way we work and get paid in this country and, well, and around the world is pretty broken. Um, but there are more ways to uh, become financially independent than just freelancing, right? Entrepreneurship is the big one. But the reason I usually steer people away from entrepreneurship is because it becomes a nightmare so fast for so many people. Uh, well, today's guest has a new take on entrepreneurship. It calls it entrepreneurial minimalism. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk to him about it. Uh, I've been following him on Twitter for a few months now, and he's a great follow. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for showing up today. Man, I'm so glad you invited me. That was a, a nice intro, too. So I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. There's more than one ways to skin a cat. But one of the things I, I've just seen so many people have these massive headaches when they start a business. And the funny thing is, uh, back in about 2010, I tried to start a financial publishing company along with a couple of copywriter friends. Uh, and it was just such a pain in the butt that we gave up. We were getting paid so much more to do client work. And we didn't have the old customer service and then media buys and all the extra stuff that comes with with entrepreneurship. So the freelancing thing just was easier in the beginning days. But uh, can you kind of give people a little bit of your entrepreneurial background? Because you didn't always start with this minimalism type take, right? No, it actually it, it came out of my own failures. And and uh, I, I guess I say I call it hubris. Um, and and I guess my my well, let me start at the beginning. I'll make this quick for everybody. But in 2009, at the age of I think 30, I started my first company and it was it was an online company It was a trading education firm that helped retail traders learn how to navigate the the currency market specifically, but we also did other things. And in my mind, I, initially, I wanted to do what everybody wants to do. I wanted to replace the income that I lost from the work I was doing previously. Uh, but very quickly, as money started to come in, uh, I, I got these dreams of grandeur, like I was going to run this multi-million dollar, like international company, and we were eventually going to raise money and you know for, for a fund that we would launch. And, and I did what everybody taught me to do and what the book said to do, which was, Hey, if you want to, if you want to survive, you got to scale up, you got to grow, you need to hire people. You need to put these systems in place so that you can work on the business instead of in the business. And so I did all those things and the money came, I, we were making millions and millions of dollars a year, but I was trapped inside of the business. Um, and, and that's what I think happens to most people. And, and so, uh, I ended up that company, I ended up leaving that company I had a fallout with my business partner and it didn't, it didn't end well, uh, in part because of my, like, as I said, my hubris, but as I reevaluated afterwards and, and decided what I wanted to do, I think that entrepreneurship, um, what we could call it freelancing. If you want to, there's solopreneurship is the key to getting the type of freedom and autonomy that we want in our lives. And, but the problem is most people don't want to do it for the reasons you just outlined. And I knew I didn't want to go back into that where I had dozens of employees and I had hundreds of thousands a year in overhead and costs. I just wanted to run my own thing. I wanted to work on stuff I was passionate about and, and, and do work that I found meaningful. And I wanted to make a decent amount of money doing it. And so I just trimmed away all the things that people said was, wasn't a good or was a good idea to do, which is scale up, hire a bunch of people. And I said, well, I'm just going to do this myself and I'm going to use modern technology and the, you know, all the different tech tools we have now to help facilitate that. So that, and, and um, now I teach it to people. So we had to come up with a name for it. And I said, well, it's, it's like entrepreneurship, but it's just, it's, it's a different form of that. It's a minimalist form of that, that I think that, the more we talk about it, the more feedback I get from people, the more excited they are. Um, I sound like I'm pitching my own stuff now, but I, I've been getting some really good feedback from people just saying, you know what, I, I've always wanted to start my own thing, but the idea of running a company seemed too overwhelming. And now the way you're explaining it to me, like, I feel like it's something I could do. And, and that's my hope is in the same way that you, you talk about freelancing and, and how you create multiple streams of income. Um, it's the same thing, but I'm doing the same thing. I'm just trying to overcome this uh, stigma that, oh, I can't be an entrepreneur because I don't really want to run a company. I think people underestimate the, uh, you've been tweeting about this a little bit, the mental health load that uh, comes with running, even just having those numbers, seeing you know $10 million a year in bottom line revenue is it's overwhelming for a lot of like, I, I know a lot of people that, you know, I've worked with a lot of direct response companies that are in the 30, 40, $100 million range. Um, and I don't want to name names, but there's a lot of problems with alcoholism and uh, just 
marriage is falling apart and all these this the stress that comes with running that big of a business it's hard to, for people to understand until you're in that position but i think people instinctively know like there's a lot of weight on your shoulders when you're trying to scale up and, and have all those employees yeah when i that was one thing i'm glad you brought that up because that's one thing that i didn't i didn't realize it would affect me the way that it did because i've been in the in the military i've been in the marines i had i had you know i you just want to say led people in combat. I, I I had been in charge in war zones and and so I I thought I would do well and do okay with that. But um, what you realize I think as an owner and and someone who's hired people is you said, hey, trust me, come work for me. I, I'll take care of you, and we're gonna you know you're gonna help facilitate the growth of this thing that hopefully you believe in, this concept you believe in. Well, what I realized was a few years after starting hiring people that I now didn't have one family to feed. It wasn't just me and, and my, my wife and my four kids. It was now 12 other people and their wives and their kids that were relying on me and the decisions I was making in the company to ensure that their families got fed. Uh, that's an overwhelming weight uh, on, on someone's shoulders. And when I, when I finally got away from that, I said, I don't wanna do that again. I don't mind having an employee from time to time if I need one or con more more typically contract labor where I would say hire them for a specific period of time to do tasks for me. But I don't ever want anybody relying on me or what I'm doing for my as their sole source of income uh, because it number one, it prevents me from taking chances that I want to take in my business. Um, but more importantly, like you said, I mean, two thirds of all entrepreneurs report having some sort of mental health issue, be it depression, anxiety, substance abuse. And it's like, that's why it's because the way that we've teaching people entrepreneurship is wrong. It doesn't produce the outcomes that most people are looking for when they start a business. So the two concepts, uh, I just remember reading your newsletter when you launched this entrepreneurial minimalism thing. The two concepts I think you really focus on are time freedom and income mobility, right? Which is kind yes. of the same things I focus on in freelancing because you can move anywhere in the world. So I have my my four cornerstones of liberty, security, wealth, awareness, and network. And the wealth is really, the way I, I picture it is that you can pick up, move anywhere in the world and be financially fine which means either you have the money in the bank or you can start earning money immediately wherever you are. That's income mobility, right? It's kind of the same yes. concept. So mm -hmm. what I guess, what what is the difference if you had to, to sum it up between the entrepreneurial minimalism and the kind of freelancing career? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it is in, well, let me explain the philosophy of this first, is that I, like you, I, I'm, I'm looking for fulfillment in my life. What And this is, gets into some philosophy, personal philosophy of mine, is I, I think happiness and this idea of happily ever after is, is a fantasy. I don't think we ever arrive at a point in our life where everything is great and the story ends. And then from then on, it's just really good. Like life is a period, it's cycles of up and down. And there are periods when you feel like you're on top of the mountain and other times you feel like you're in the valley. And I think that all, so I think that trying to be happy all the time is is a really poor measure of whether or not you're you're leading a good life or not. Uh, fulfillment, though, I think you can be fulfilled even in the darkest of times, even when things are really falling apart. I think you can still be fulfilled in your life if some th certain things are in place. And I think the biggest one is a sense of autonomy, this idea that we can do what we want, when we want, where we want, for as long as we want, with whoever we want. Um, without having to consider the cost, right? I would consider that to be maximum autonomy or total freedom, right? Um, that's kind of a pipe dream. Like nobody has that. Nobody's right. going to ever not be responsible for somebody else in their lives or it doesn't have to answer to somebody. Uh, but I think we can work towards maximum autonomy, which is how close to that sort of ideal of being completely free can we get? And when I look at that, I say, well, what are the two things that create that maximum autonomy and give us the most amount of fulfillment. Well, I think there are two things. I think it's time freedom. I get to spend my days doing things that I find enjoyable and that I'm passionate about that I that give my life purpose. And then the other half of that is I can do that from anywhere. That I'm not restricted right. to one location or one city or one even one country if I don't want to do that. And I, I wrote a book about this concept a couple of years ago uh, called um, the nomadic wealth formula. And it was a it, it was an idea that I had at the time, and it had kind of been how I structured my life, and I thought it was a good philosophy for living. 
And people got wrapped up around the idea of mobility and, oh, I don't want to be a nomad. I don't want to not have a home. I kind of like where I live and I just would, I would like to have a little more freedom. And so entrepreneurial minimalism is really an attempt to try and explain to people, look, you don't, you don't have to move around the world and live like a Bedouin, you know, but it's nice to have the option to go where you want and to maybe work from another state or from another country for a while while you're traveling. Um, and so the difference between on, what I would call entrepreneurial minimalism and, uh, and freelancing has more to do with, has more to do with how you come into your buyers. Mm -hmm. So in freelancing, what you'll typically do is go to a freelancing site or, um, or, or you'll go out and, uh, and find somebody who has people who are looking for work and then you'll bid on that work, freelancer.com, stuff like that. And so you're using someone else's distribution channel to bring you business. Um, as a solopreneur, as someone who practices entrepreneurial minimalism, you would also be in charge of bringing those leads in. So before we talked, I see you were like, what do you want? To, is there anything you wanted people to know about? And I said, just tell them about the website because I've got the, you know, the newsletter. And my only goal is uh, finding people who are interested in this concept because I figured out if I can get people to read my newsletter, um, sales tend to take care of themselves. And so I focus primarily probably 90% of my time on lead acquisition, because I know the more people who find out about this concept, the more interested they'll be. And ultimately the more coaching and consulting clients I'll have. Yeah. It's funny. You, you were mentioning the job boards. I typically think if you're using the job boards as a freelancer, you're doing it wrong or you're not doing oh, really? it in the, in the ideal way. Yeah. It's better. Well, tell wait. me, tell me how you tell people to do it then. I basically, so I have a, a concept called the mobile money skill stack. And it's basically, you don't want to be just a copywriter. You don't want to be just a graphic designer. You want to find your talents and skills and narrow it into something that only you do basically. So you're, you don't have competition. I didn't have competition as a copywriter because I wasn't just doing copywriting. I was doing full production video back before anybody really started doing it. And before that I was doing the copy and you know, my first couple things I was doing web design and copy because that's what those people needed. So basically you're creating a, a, uh, a market of one only you can fulfill the service that you're selling and then you go out and network uh, i have a, a viral pitch uh formula that people can go through and kind of it, it creates a statement you know how business owners love to complain about things so mm -hmm. it, you create a statement that everybody remembers and as soon as you hear that business owner complaining you're like oh i know a guy that does this this and this um and so you're basically you're creating inbound marketing that way through people that didn't necessarily know they needed you um, so it's more of a word of mouth where you create. So I, I would refer to that as category design and having a point of view. So exactly the same yeah. thing, just a little bit different languaging uh, where you create um, you, you create an environment where you can be the only leader because you own the category yeah. that you're, you're playing in, which is exactly the same thing that you said. And um, and that's interesting. So you you're more about we're going to we're going to create sort of this this distinction in you. And then we're going to talk about that in a way that makes it easy for people who learn about you to refer business to you um, that you may have never seen coming. Yeah, exactly. And then you have, so you have your viral pitch, which is something that you tell people that might not directly hire you, right? That's designed to be, to spread the word about you, which mm -hmm. is just to get you the contact. And then you have your offer that you create. Uh, this is the kind of your primary thing you sell. So for me, it would have been like video product or video sales letters back before that was like what everybody did. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, I do these coaching calls with all of my students and it's amazing. Everybody has all these talents that they don't recognize in themselves. Yeah. People are really bad at recognizing their own skills and talents. Um, and so just pulling that out of people is really, it's kind of fun to watch. Um, so, you know, I've worked with a scientists who didn't realize they could go on and do like, um, like basically white paper, but endorsed white papers. So that's yeah. kind of an interesting market because you have a PhD and you're writing, you know, you're doing the copywriting with white papers, but you're also endorsing. So you're kind of a, an expert getting paid. So you're getting paid more than just what a normal white paper copywriter would get paid. Um, yeah. Engineers that have 30 some years of experience are coaching teams now of younger engineers. So it's interesting things that people didn't know they were good at teaching, they were good at engineering, but now they're going out to these companies and saying like, let me stop your junior engineering team from making these big mistakes with just, you know, a couple hours of coaching a week. So it's all yeah. these interesting things that people, you know, they didn't know that the, the being able to teach younger engineers was a, was a skill that was valuable, but it's incredibly valuable. Well, and it, yeah. And number it's, it, it, so the way you're explaining it, then um, they're, they're, 
some of them may in fact already be practicing entrepreneurial minimalism. And keep, keep in mind, this is a philosophy. And so um, it differs in say solopreneurship because if you're a solopreneur, one would say that you have no employees and that's not always the case, but okay. you in name, it, you should have no employees. And I'm not saying don't have any employees. I'm not saying don't have contractors. I'm saying with every decision that you make in the business, instead of focusing on how do I grow? How do I scale? How do I make this thing bigger? If every decision you make, you ask, okay, does this increase my time freedom, the, the amount of time that I control in my life? And, and does it ultimately, will it ultimately increase my income mobility? And if it also increases the income, great. That there's nothing. One of the things that we try and choose industries where and, and where we get compounding effects. Where, like you said, it doesn't matter whether I have one coaching client or a hundred coaching clients. My time is relatively the same. Same thing about selling a course or something on how to do something. Uh, you know, you, I can sell one course or a thousand courses a month, and it's no extra effort on my part, other than maybe some support stuff that I have to do. And so by choosing things like that, industries like that, and, and businesses, uh, we get a compounding effect that allows us to increase income without increasing overhead, uh, which ultimately is what we all want. We want, you know, I mean, the profit margins in my business, I don't know what they are in yours, but mine are around 96%. Yeah. So I keep 96 cents of every dollar that comes in. It's pure profit. Uh, and that's before taxes. But when you talk to people who are in traditional businesses or traditional entrepreneurs, like they don't, they don't even believe those numbers are possible because they're living in largely an, an analog world uh, when now everything's going digital and what was assumed to be at one time to be like BS sort of careers. Oh, he's a coach. He's a consultant. He's another one of these guys. It's like, no, no, no. Those are very legitimate businesses and you don't need very much, um, you don't need very many clients to make a very good living doing that. Um, I talk a lot about the education system and how I think the education system as we know it today will be gone in two generations, maybe one, because everybody who's there now are all old sort of pre-internet people who are in tenure and they don't understand the way the world works. And, and getting an education is expensive to do it the old way. And it's very cheap to do it the new way. And so there's more and more people are like, oh, I can buy a course on that from somebody who's doing it right now for a tenth of the cost of going to college for it. Uh, and it takes six months instead or six weeks instead of six months. Well, now that, that changes everything. And so um, I think it's a it's an amazing business to be in. And it's an amazing way of structuring the business so that you can you can have the life that you really want instead of the business becoming your life, which is what happens to most people. So yeah, I, I guess I would say the difference between then the freelancing and the entrepreneurial minimalism is in freelancing, a lot of time it is just a service business. So you are somewhat limited by your time. Now there's ways around this. You can get a piece of you know the the profits and all that. But at the end of the day, you still are doing work and getting paid for it in, on some capacity. But with the entrepreneurial things is I typically consider if you're selling a product, uh, then it's more entrepreneurial. If you're selling a service, it's more freelancing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's probably a fair way to distinguish it. I just think that everybody as they're building whatever their business is, that if they if they consider those two questions before they make any decision, and then choose the decision that creates the most amount of time freedom and income mobility, they'll ultimately feel more fulfilled in the work they do, and they'll be happier. Uh, and you won't have all the problems that come with traditional entrepreneurship. Right. Um, because that's really what when you build a business as a as a traditional entrepreneur, the goal is to one day build that business to a point where you can sell it. And so as you're building it, you're trying to put all of these machine pieces in place, either human or technological, so that the thing will uh, so the thing will print money for you. Because one day you want to sell that to somebody. And when somebody buys a business, they're not buying they're not buying the company. They're buying a system for producing profit. That's what they're doing. And when they look at the business, if that profit if, isn't repeatable, if you leave, extricate yourself from the business and the business doesn't function without you, then you don't have a sellable business. And so you'll see as businesses start to grow, all the discussion becomes around systematizing everything and making sure that we're, you know, the profit margins get tighter, but we can do more. And we figured out how to borrow money so that we can afford the inventory in order to meet the demand. All of that leads to, all that, in my opinion, creates a prison for the entrepreneur. I've and seen now they're stuck. 
yeah, I, I've just seen a lot of companies that they had, they were good direct response businesses. They had, you know, products and supplements or something like that. And then they decided that they wanted to be able to sell the business. And so they took all the humanity out of it. They took the personality out of it. Um, and they, they put in, they took investors, they tried to, to grow that way. And all of a sudden people weren't buying anymore because the, mm -hmm. their core competency was actually the direct response marketing. And then they tried to make it this, you know, saleable brand business and it just didn't translate. So people can ruin their own businesses by trying to get in that mindset of like, I have to, you know, they follow the traditional advice and say, I have to sell this or, you know, I want to sell this and get my big exit and then go live on a beach when they could have just scaled back their work, had a better lifestyle the whole time by kind of focusing on the minimalism thing. If they would just made decisions more along the line of what you're saying, then they, they would, they would have gotten more than more of what they wanted in the long run anyway. Yeah. And I, I you bring up a good point because I think that a lot of people, if they're working in jobs, especially that they are not really very passionate about, and it might pay them well, and they might feel okay about the work, but they're really working towards a period in their life when they can stop working and they can begin enjoying, you know, not having to go to the office every day. Uh, I, I think for myself personally, and I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, they, they don't think like that. My job, my goal is not to work to some point when I can't, when I don't have to work anymore, because I, I really do work on things that I, I, I enjoy. And if I get a new passion project that pops up, I can go and pursue that. And, and it, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't disrupt the other business stuff that I do. So I get to kind of play around in a lot of different sandboxes. Uh, for example, I, I'm a part owner in a, in a startup in Silicon Valley uh, that it sounds really cool, but it's really just, it's this business that doesn't make any money, but it's got a really cool idea and they wanted me to come in and help with the marketing for it. And, and, uh, got a little piece of the company to help with that. And it's fun to do. It's not making any money. It might, maybe we'll make a hundred million dollars more than likely it'll go nowhere, but it sure is fun to work on. And the people are cool. Uh, I get to kind of pursue that stuff because of the way I've organized my life. But to the, to your point, I don't, my goal is not to get to a point where I don't work anymore. My point is to get the business to a point where I can do it for the rest of my life and I can continue to write and consult and work with people who are trying to develop their businesses and provide advice and counsel for that. And as I get older and more experienced that the, my value should increase with that new knowledge and experience, as long as I keep my skills up to date. And so I want to find business that I can do from anywhere on earth and I can work as little or as much as I want to. And that's the concept of entrepreneurial minimalism is being able to do that. Yeah. To, to me, retirement sounds like a death sentence. Like, I don't know what I would, what, what's the purpose? Like, because I've, I've always, you know, I started copywriting when I was 22 or 23. I've always worked for myself. It's never felt like, you know, I had one corporate job as a flight attendant, actually, uh, for a year after college. And then I was working for myself for the rest of the time. So this this whole concept of retirement, I think, is just it's an outdated concept. I don't, I don't think your brain expires or <laughs> when it expires, it does. But that's the end of your life anyway. So I don't know why people want to retire. It's because work is so broken. People hate what they do or they don't they're not passionate about it. They might not hate what they do, but it doesn't fulfill them in the same ways that you're kind of talking about. Yeah, no, you're right. And and I, I, if you say oh, people hate what they do, some of them do, but yeah. a lot of people are like, eh, this is okay. Like I, work isn't everything. You know, I have a family, life's pretty good. I'm making pretty good money. Uh, and, and so I'm not, I don't know that I'm talking to those people. I, I think I'm talking to people who are hungry for something else. They, they want, they work an eight, 10 hours a day and they're like, Hey, I want the eight to 10 hours to mean something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'll even, I, some people have told me, <clears throat> I've talked with some people, they're like, I don't even need to replace my income. Like we, I'm, I do. Okay. I just want to replace a you know, portion of that income and be able to do the things that I want to do. Uh, and, and I think this is another shift in thinking that, uh, I, I think a lot of the entrepreneurial stuff that you get fed, especially on social media is how to get rich, you know, mm -hmm. how to, you know, the Ferraris and big houses and stuff. And, and I've had all that I've had real, I'm, I'm, the last house I owned, because I don't even own a home anymore, uh, was seven, almost 8,000 square feet. And we had sections of the house that I didn't even go into. It was so big. It was just there in case we had family come for Christmas. And what I realized was, was all of that's just more headache. It's just another six or $7,000 every month that you got to spend for a mortgage and then maintenance on top of the house on top of that. And I, I don't... I, 
business isn't about being rich. It's about creating freedom for yourself. And if you have really high dreams and you're like, Hey, freedom to me is being able to fly on private planes and stay at, you know, at the Mandarin in New York city, whenever I go and anything short of that is, isn't acceptable. Well, then you got to make a lot more money. But for most people, that's not the case. They're like, Hey, I want good cash flow. I want enough money at the, at the end to put some money away. So I got a little nest egg or something for the kids when they go to college. And beyond that, I just want to be free to do whatever I want. And that's, I, it sounds crazy, but I really have managed to build a life like that. And it's a really intriguing concept when people start to hear it because no longer, it's no longer, Oh, I have all of this, this, this huge weight that I'm going to have to carry. It's like, no, man, it's actually the best parts of life all kind of like organized together. There's a, I know people that listen to my podcast have probably heard me say this a bunch, but, uh, I think I got an email one time. It was like, oh, all right, Mr. Rich Copywriter, man. Like now that you have all the money, like what, what's the purpose? What are you doing next? And I mean, I, I wrote an email and I, I've used it several times, but I think there's three reasons that people want to make money. The first one's power. And those people are in Washington and they scare me. Uh, the second mm-hmm. one is status. And a lot more people are going after status than I think want to admit that they're just doing it for the status. It's And there's you can't win at the status game with money because there's always going to be somebody richer than you. You're always then playing, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. And I've seen people that make four or five million dollars a year be miserable because there's somebody else they know making 10 or 20 million. You, you get in those circles and it just it's a never ending treadmill. And then the last one's freedom. And I think only there's only a certain percentage of the country or of people that want to make money for freedom. I don't think that people, enough people realize that what they really would be happiest with is having the money for freedom. And then you get to have less of it. You get to use it more, deploy it more strategically. And so it sounds like what, what you're saying is like, yeah, you have, you did the status thing a little bit and then you went back to, well, no, the money is for the freedom. Well, and, and don't get me wrong. Like there, there is, it is nice to walk into a room and, and people know who you are and, and they respect you for what you've accomplished. You know, those are, but I, I think growing up poor, um, and I, I grew up re, real, relatively poor, like trailer park poor. Um, <clears throat> when you don't, when you grow up with nothing, then you think that, oh, and you look at the way the other side lives and the closer you are to the other side, I think the more pronounced this is. Uh, so my grandparents were very wealthy and in the summer times they would they would take us to the the country club golf course to do you know uh, t- kid golf every you know a couple of times a week and you know I live in a trailer but you know I'm going and seeing all these rich kids and so as a kid I was I was really close it kind of created uh, number one I figured out that the divide between me and them wasn't that far like it was close so it wasn't like I grew up in the ghetto and I I never knew anybody who'd made it like I got to see it up close, but it made it, it created this concept in my mind that, oh, if I had all that, I'd be happy. Mm-hmm. And so I went out and I made all that. And I did quite a bit better than probably anybody who was <laughs> anybody whose parents were at that at country club. Uh, and, and I realized I was still miserable that, you know, I, I had, I'd been in a marriage that you know, was the wrong person for me. And I'd spent, a, you know, 10 years ducking and hiding that. And I was, the business was my whole life. And the only friends I had were the people who worked in the business. You know, those were my friends. And, and I got, I just said, I, this isn't, this is not what it's cracked up to be. I, I built my life the wrong way because I thought these things were important and they weren't. Now that doesn't mean money's not important. Money's really important. Money solves a lot of problems, but if money is the ultimate goal, then you end up building, like I said, probably a life that you don't really want. But if you can, if you understand that money is the tool that facilitates the freedom that you want and you use the money that way, what you realize is I don't need nearly as much money as I thought I did. And, uh, and you can build a life that actually is fulfilling. And, and that's, as I said, that's, I'm not, I'm not here to tell anybody how to live their lives because I feel like I've made plenty of mistakes in mine. Uh, but I, ha- I, I do think I know a little bit about what makes people happy and, and how to construct a business that pro- gives you the best chance at that, at that level of fulfillment. So sticking with that, what, who, you've worked with a bunch of people and a bunch of different businesses. I guess, what are the categories of business that work best for this? And what are the types of people that uh, kind of find this the most attractive? <clears throat> yeah. So what works best are digital products and services. So lots of consulting or coaching, 
um, because of the transition that's happening in our economy right now, uh, it is it probably feels like there's just everybody on their planet is a coach or a consultant. And and the problem is, is we got a lot of young kids who, who the be all end all is just being an influencer online. Mm-hmm. And that's very different than what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm talking about people who have 10 years, 20 years or more of experience in their craft, like you, you know, professional copywriter done really well for yourself and you're working for other people. And, and then you say, well, you know what? I'm, pretty good at this. I imagine I could probably help somebody else because as far as I'm concerned, the skill that you have is the most valuable one that anybody can have, which is the ability to effectively communicate value. Uh, and, And so if you have that skill, that's the one. Everything else builds on that. And so you having that skill and then saying, you know what, I'll bet there's some other people who would be real interested in learning this skill from me. And you take that to market. That's what I'm talking about. So things like health and beauty, how to stay healthy and fit, um, you know, how to keep skin and, and nutrition and stuff. That's one. Uh, business and investing would be another one. Um, you have uh, even stuff like, it sounds crazy, but vice things like gambling. If you know how to make, how to, how to play poker well, you know, these types of things are really good businesses to have. Also, anything that can be done uh, and you can consolidate from brick and mortar into digital. So one example would be, let's say you own a dog training facility where you bring the dogs in and you do, you do boarding where you work with the dogs one-on-one, very expensive. And then you also do like group coaching classes. Well, okay. That's a great business, but it has a lot of restrictions. It it limitations. It has, um, uh, it has a size limitation. It has location limitation, which means it has the number of people that you can have or that you could potentially have as customers is limited. Well, what if we take that business and we move it online and instead of boarding dogs and running them through a six week program, we actually have an entire course that we sell for a fraction of the cost that teaches that entire program in a way that makes it easy for a new dog owner to do that with their dog. And then what if instead of doing group coaches, group coaching locally with these dogs, we did online coaching where we brought everybody together and, and they got to work with their dog in their living room with you right there watching and, and helping out with the process. Um, that's a possibility now where it wasn't before. You can buy the technology and you can put it together and you can increase the, num- the amount of money that you can make at that business, increase the reach, increase the customer base, and also be able to do that job from anywhere. So that's one way that you can take a traditional business and look for ways to add the sort of, you know, the more of the, uh, the digital component to it. It's funny. I have a, uh, a very good friend of mine is uh, he's worked in hospitality and restaurants for almost 20 years, I think. Uh, And he's worked in some of the the best restaurants in the country, uh, the top restaurant groups. And he's found all these different ways you know, he's been a manager at all these restaurants. He knows all the different ways to make money in a restaurant. Here's how you make events, make you extra money. Here's how you increase your beverage sales. Here's how you manage your costs. And he's going out and, you know, he's looking for a new job right now and he's at the six figure level. So it's, he's not looking for small jobs, but I'm trying to convince him to create a course to teach smaller restaurants how to make money. And it just feels so unnatural. To, to people that have been employed their whole life to look at the world this way and say, well, I can, my information is valuable to other people. He's just, well, well, restaurant, restaurants don't spend money. I'm like, they do when you can show them how to make more money. So it's just a, a foreign way of thinking for a lot of people. So have you had, I guess who, have you had people come in and not be a good fit for this type of, of program? Like who's, does it work with this type of uh, entrepreneurial lifestyle? Cause I think some of it's personality. I think it is. I think you, you, you have to be, so again, any business, regardless of what you do, I always say, no matter what business you think you're in, you're in the marketing and the sales business. Uh, now that scares a lot of people off. It doesn't, doesn't have to, what, but you have to be, you have to at least have some interest in that aspect of what you do. I don't like selling. I, I don't like trying to convince people to spend money with me. What I want to do is I want my marketing and all the work I did before they came to me to do most of that selling for me. So by the time they get to me, it's really more of questions like, um, like qualifying questions. Like, I just want to make sure I understand everything correctly before I give you money. Mm -hmm. Um, 
<laughs> that I always say I want people showing up money in hand begging for me to take it uh, because I just don't like that sort of that, that sort of hard handed or any type of selling approach. Um, and so I think you do have to have some sort of willingness to go out and, and do some self promotion. And I think that keeps a lot of people from doing it. They're like, like you said, I don't really feel like I have any value. I don't really feel like anybody would give me money for that that lack of self-confidence is will make people a bad fit i think another thing that makes folks a bad fit is if they come into it and they are they don't have a long enough time horizon so i think a lot of people come in and some of it's because of the way they've been sold this online yeah. that oh this should take me three to six months and i should be able to like have something going yeah that i'm at ten thousand dollars a month after three yeah, months no, of it's, following the system it just doesn't work yeah it's way. ridiculous like if you any of your audience ever hears anything like that like i made ten thousand dollars in 30 days let me show you exactly how it, they're lying to you right that nobody does that um, there's some other piece of that that they haven't mentioned to you like oh i already had a gigantic list of people to market to <laughs> You know, there's always something because you need distribution. You need a group of people who know, like, and trust you to give you money. And so I think people who don't, who are, it's got to be now or never, those people are a bad fit because it's going to take you, I say, 18 to 24 months before you're going to start to see some traction in that business. Uh, so you have to be willing to kind of just work at it and, and have some faith that it, at the end, if you do the things correctly, that it'll pay off. And I think one of the things that I help people with is help them help them kind of find, like you said, that thing that makes them unique and then help them message that. Because as we talked about earlier on in the show, if you get enough people who are coming to you who are interested in the thing that you do, the rest of the money kind of takes care of itself. I mean, it's not that you don't have to do any work, but you don't, it's not like that the biggest the biggest hurdle is over. Once they come to you and they've kind of self-selected and they say, hey, I'm interested in what you do. Maybe it's six months before they buy, but the heavy lifting is already done. They've already, you've already got them. So that's the part that we spend the most time on because you know, as you know, customers have a really hard time distinguishing between products, especially if the product is complicated. For a lot of years, I did consulting work for the financial, for the financial industry, uh, wealth managers, money managers, stuff like that. One of the biggest hurdles for them is regulation prevents them from creating anything truly unique because mm -hmm. if one person has a product everybody can have a similar product and they most they mostly do they just name it differently and the second thing is it's so complicated what they do none of the people that they are selling understand it which is why they're coming to them right if they understood what they were doing they just do it themselves and they'd save themselves the fees but they they don't understand it. So they're selling a product that's indistinguishable from anybody else's in a market where none of their buyers understand what they're what they're buying. That makes it really hard. Uh, and so one of the ways that one of the easiest ways for you to overcome that, and one of the ways we did that was by creating brand trusted brands around the product. So it wasn't necessarily the product they were buying; it was the brand, which was the individual that was selling it. And so. That was one of the things that I got really good at. Um, I forgot your original question, but it was like, who is not right for this product or whatever. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think it's anybody who's locked in an old mentality as well. I think if you're in an analog world and you can't see past the fact that it's not a physical product, so it's worthless. Um, that's crazy because our, as I said, our education system is so bad. Uh, there's so much opportunity for people who actually know what they're doing to teach it. It's funny. I have, uh, you know, I have a lot of libertarian friends. I'm just kind of in the movement. I, I hooked in a little bit. Uh, and one of the things that most people have recently stopped doing is trying to convert people to like see the liberty <clears throat> point of view. And they're just saying, all right, now we're going to help the people that already have this perspective because we've tried spreading the message. We've written books. We've done the podcasts. Uh, and now the world's exactly where we predicted it would be given this philosophy and the monetary system. Uh, so let's help people. So I feel like we're not going to convert people to wanting to be the entrepreneurial minimalists, right? Which, so it's more of attracting the people, finding the people that are right for it, right? So who, what are, what are the characteristics you see of people that are like the perfect fit to jump into this? Yeah. Like personality well, characteristics. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you're right. Like we're never going to, in order for somebody to be converted, they have to be willing to be converted. If you do any study, um, I, I'm a huge fan, I say fan, of... I'm a huge studier of cults uh, okay. because it's always, it's always struck me as 
as interesting the the kind of people who join cults because you would think it would be these crazy fringe kind of kooky people but it's not it's doctors it's lawyers it's very well educated and intelligent people you're like what causes them to do that and in most cases they've come to a point where they're at a crossroads in their life some pieces on they're unhappy with and they're searching for meaning or something and then the cult shows up and they ended up get wrapped getting wrapped up in it but but people used to ask me I, I used to have a very big libertarian podcast and um people would always ask me well how do i how do i convince these people to you know that their way of thinking is wrong i said you'll never do that like that's a that's a fool's errand what you do is look for the people who are searching for something different who feel disenfranchised and then you say hey i have this new thing over here that you may never have heard of but I, th I think it would speak to you if you'd be willing to, to look at it objectively. That's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't look for anybody and try and convince them to do this. Um, people are already hungry for change. And there are people who already built businesses that they're not happy with. All I'm simply doing is, is just being an advocate for the concept and then saying, if this makes sense to you and you want to learn more, I'm, I'm happy to show you more. Um, so the people who are really good for this are people who are very highly self-motivated because this is a business that you will largely do alone. Uh, the, you are not going to go into an office. You, you have to have some drive and ambition that, that causes you to get up and work every day. Uh, there are also people who are of above average intelligence. I think that you kind of need to be in order to, in order to do this work. Uh, it's it'd be really hard if you were below average because i mean average intelligence in america is between 85 and 115 in the, on the iq score and, and i'd say you know anything above 100 you'd probably be okay um so above average intelligence and, and then you have some sort of skill set that is valuable to somebody else and it doesn't have to be I, to give you an idea of this it, done, it can be some crazy stuff. So I have a, it's not a client of mine, but he's somebody who's been listening to the show for a long time. And he was trying to figure out, he was a former drug addict who had been cleaned up and he's trying to make something out of his life. He's doing this like backbreaking work for a company in a factory. And his son asked him, hey dad, remember that video game, that driving video game we had? Um, do you still have that on your computer? And he said, no. So we went and loaded the game on the computer and the kid was playing this sim racing game on the computer. And what he realized was he was kind of doing it with his son as a, as a way to connect with his son. And what he realized was, man, people treat this really seriously. Like they, they spend a lot of money trying to fit. And each race that you go to, you can balance the car differently. I've got a point to this story. You can balance the car differently and you need to for different tracks. Yeah. And so what he did was in his genius mind was he figured out what the way to balance the cars to make them the best for that track. And then he would sell them this designs for this to other race car drivers for like 60 bucks a month or something like that. I can't remember what it was. And when I talked to him, I interviewed him on the show, he was making close to $7,000 a month <laughs> doing this for other race car drivers who are driving in fake races with no money, right? So there's no monetary value and he's selling $6,000 a month in subscription stuff to these folks. And he's probably over 10 or 20,000 now because it's a big industry. But there was value in this. He found the value inside of his passion and his knowledge. And if you have been working for any period of time, you probably have that. Uh, but you've got to have something that is valuable. So if you've been working at, if you've been working flipping the fryer at McDonald's for the last 10 years, making minimum wage, you may have to work on your skill set first. Um, but once you have something of value, then now everything becomes how do we tell people about it? Yeah. I there's not a lot of people that listen to podcasts uh, and, you know, are interested at all in this that have been flipping burgers for the past 10 years. So normally, no, yeah, people, people in this world are, they're self-educators, right? That's who listens to podcasts. They're always, we're always trying to improve, you know? <laughs> so it's, your skill set is probably broader than you think it is if you're listening to this. <laughs> Um, well, it's like you said earlier, one of the tough things is convincing people that, hey, what you, you really have something of value here. You should pursue this. Uh, we were talking on my show this week or last week, the, the, the median income, not the average, but the median income in America is like at 45 is $61,000 a year. 
You know, that means half people make more than that, half make less, right in the middle, 60. So you're talking between 50 and maybe $80,000 a year is what your average person makes in a year. And I'm going, it, I don't want to make it sound easier than it is, but if people understood how easy it was to make $100,000 a year on your own, working from home <laughs> on your own terms, uh, we wouldn't have anybody working at jobs anymore, traditional jobs. You'd have bulk of people would be out because overcoming that sixty to eighty thousand dollar hurdle, whew, man, it's just it's it's not as difficult as one would think. Uh, I mean, that's why I sell the freelancing course because there's so many people that are in that that you just have to understand. And again, it's about communicating value. That's why I I thought about doing freelancing for copywriters, but it's the need is so much broader, and the skill set of freelancing is different than the skill set of copywriting. So. Yeah. I've had a lot of people get in the course and be like, this is, I didn't know I could do this. And I was scared to quit because of health insurance. And I was scared mm -hmm. because my, what about retirement? I was like, well, if you're self-motivated enough to get a hundred thousand dollars a year in income and go out and do the work and find the clients, you can figure out health insurance. It's actually not that hard. Uh, yeah. I, use, I use crowd health. It's, it's been perfect for everything I've needed so far. I have my own retirement investments. It's like, you don't need this stuff. There are other options that the, this, it's kind of a trap that people see all these things that come with the jobs. Yeah. You can escape it. There are other options. You just have to realize that the money will solve those problems. Like having, if you have $150,000, it's way better than having an $80,000 job that has these benefits with it. Yes. Yes. Oh, you, you nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. And, and I think one of the beautiful things about what you teach and, and the way I teach entrepreneurship is that you don't have to quit your job and just right. pour yourself into it full time. It's like, that's a, that's a foolish way to get into something that you've never done before. Like start small, um, build yourself, go out and start, you know, define what it is that you do and go start telling people about it. Go start helping people for free and start building that value. And, and it's a, it's a relatively simple process to start building an email list. And then over, as I said, 12, 18, 24 months, as the money starts to come in and you learn the skill of entrepreneurship, a business, now all of a sudden, then the light goes on and you're like, oh yeah, like I can pay for my whole family to have full coverage insurance for $10,000 a month, right? And you go, okay, well, I'm making 80 grand a year now and they're sucking money out for healthcare and, and I'm not getting all the tax deductions I could get because I, I don't run a business. And so if I'm making a hundred grand or 120 grand a year in my side business, well, then who cares how much insurance costs? It's still better than working at the company. So that, that kind of stuff, you start to realize that, and, and you could do it for a lot less than $10,000 yeah. a month. I'm just saying, if you wanted to do it the old way and go get traditional insurance, you can still do that. Or crowd health is like, what is it? Like two, 199 bucks a month or something. It's something ridiculously yeah, cheap. Yeah. I think I'm at 185 a month or something yeah. for, for just me. It's, it's incredibly cheap and it's, it, yeah. you know, it's paid for itself essentially. Yeah. Yeah, no. So there, there are all these third party options now that didn't exist before, but you have to be willing to color outside the lines, right? You have to be willing to get off. Um, Tom Woods would call, you know, it's called the index card of allowable opinions, like of what's acceptable for you to do in this world. And what's the acceptable way for you to, to go about making a living and caring for yourself. And I think as, as libertarian people as and I have many libertarian friends as well. Um, that's something that, every one of us should want. Um, I've always said, there's a lot of people in, in, in libertarian communities who spend all their time railing against government and talking about how good their ideas are and how bad everybody else's ideas are and, and how free the people would be if they just followed the philosophy. Now, I happen to believe that's true in most cases, right? But the truth is, if somebody can tell you where you got to be, when you got to be there, how long you got to stay, what you got to do while you're there, and how you got to do it for eight to 10 hours a day, you are not free. So you can spend your time trying to fix everybody else, or you could turn it inward and say, how do I fix me? Maybe I can't free everybody, but I can free myself and my family. And how do I do that in yeah. time, freedom, and income mobility? It's exactly, uh, you know, the original name of my podcast was Getting Out of the Machine. Um, and then I changed it to Practical Liberty, just a little punch here. But the whole thing's modeled on Harry Brown's How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. Yes. Like just that great concept book. is, and it's a little weird in some places, but it's overall, it's a great book. And it's just most of the things holding people back are their own beliefs. That's their, you know, there's, there's some lies that people tell you about how the things should work. But if you can actually just 
reason from first principles and say, well, why is this actually, is this actually a rule or is this just an expectation? You can find so much freedom in your own life through, I mean, the internet has opened up so many opportunities. Freelancing has opened up so many opportunities. The The world is just a bigger place than people I think are, are letting themselves see. And there's so much more opportunity out there. Uh, yeah. That it's, yeah, it's incredible what you can do if you just stop limiting yourself. Yeah. And I think it's an easier hurdle when you say to somebody, I'm not asking you to quit your job. I'm not asking you to commit your life savings to this. I'm not asking you to cash in the 401k. All I'm saying is, you know, in my case, we ran our cohort. Our cohort is, uh, uh, is 700 bucks for three months. And we run people. I'm, I'm saying, you know, spend a little bit of money and test this out. I have another, I have a program called uh, a bootstrap it program. That's $125. And it goes through, it walks you through every step of getting from zero from nothing to a thousand dollars a month in recurring income uh, and walks you through every step of that process. 125 bucks, spend 125 bucks and then invest some time in trying to make that work. And, you know, I tell my audience, if not me, find somebody. You don't trust me enough. Go find somebody else that you do trust enough and and pour yourself into it because the rewards are so great. They so outweigh the risk that you're taking. And it's never been cheaper or easier. I mean, I, I look at my tech stack now, the tools that I use to run my business. Even if I look back 10 years ago, so I went back to 2011 and looked at what it would cost to do video editing, to do, you know, um, audio podcasting, or we didn't have really podcasting wasn't as much of a thing back then. Um, but how do you, running the business, CRM management software, page builders, all that stuff. Um, it's dropped by at least 10x. You know, I can run my entire business on my own, 500 bucks a month. It's actually a little less than that. It's like 460 bucks a month, right? And I... My, my company brings in hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, pat my own back, but um, you can calculate the profit margin on that. It's massive. Uh, I don't worry. So that, that's the, the concept that you're after is that very little risk, massive reward. All you have to do, as I said, is have a little longer time horizon than three months and you can get there. And the tools are going to get cheaper and cheaper as we, we move on from here. I mean, I think AI... Uh, it's not replacing writers like some of the people want you to believe, but it is replacing coders in a lot of ways, or it's at dramatically shortcutting the process. You know, you can test code now. You can have um, chat GPT write and test code in almost any language now. I mean, that's it's an incredible thing. You're going to be able to design your own. You're just going to be able to describe a website, and it'll be built for you soon. So the, yeah. the hurdles for sharing the value you have are coming down lower and lower. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up AI because I think that, number one, I'm, I'm writing about this in, in next week's uh, letter is that I, I think that you see a lot of people right now who are like, well, if you're not into AI, you're falling behind. <laughs> and I, I equate that to it being 1995 and the internet had really just come out and you're still on AOL dial up and nobody even knew what it was. It was just a bunch of chat rooms and where people were storing massive amounts of data and information on these yeah. sites it's akin to saying in 1995, if you're not focused on the internet right now, you're falling behind. It's like, no, you're not. Like, you, you need to know it's out there. Or you need to kind of be paying attention to some of the things that it will do. But the difference between 95 and today is that the cost of, of software development has fallen by 100x. And so anybody can start creating these apps and creating these products overnight. And so what you have now is everybody's hopped on this bandwagon of AI. And now every piece of software is AI software. And most of it's garbage. If you go to most of the writing apps, most of the AI stuff, it's garbage. And even when it gets good, what it will never be able to do is it will never be able to assist with the with the complexity of of life experience and so it can read a thousand different articles on what happened with a specific company it can process that and do, and do um and great suggestions out of that what it can't do at least not for the foreseeable future is know what it was like to sit in the room when the decisions were being made and to see how the little changes and deviations in conversations affected the outcome. It can't, it can't overcome that life experience. It can, it can do data, but it can't overcome life experience. And so the real value moving forward, I think, in the information business is not in, in, in giving people information because that's 
information's free and readily right. available, and it's getting even easier to access. Um, but implementation is still very difficult, and that's something AI can't really help with. It can give information, provide suggestion, but it can't do that nuanced sort of thing that you know, that you and I can do having been in the business for as many years as we have been. And so I think that, and that's true across the board for people who are looking at getting into the industry is that AI is not going to replace that type of work for the foreseeable future. And if it is, then you know, you've already learned some skills about how to build a business by then. So you could just move into something else because those skills are transferable. Yeah. I, I'm, I love that analogy of it being like 95 with the internet, because it's true. It's, it's, kind of cool right now. You can see some potential with it, but it's not revolutionizing the world right now. Like it hasn't brought costs down in businesses by 90x like they're saying it will. And maybe in 20 years it does, but at the same time there's going to be new opportunities that open up. There always are. So I like I just don't fear AI the way some people do. Uh, I mean, if it becomes fully conscious, then we're all screwed anyway. So what's the <laughs> point in worrying about it? Yeah, I don't I, I don't even know that either. I, I I can't predict the future. I I look out and I'm I'm kind of like you. I say this is kind of interesting and I test the new tools and see how they work and some of them I've been playing around with Midjourney for a while trying to figure out the prompts to make it create the images that I, and it's a fun exercise but I I would I still wouldn't use Midjourney to design a logo for me or or anything like that. I'd I'd go to a somebody who knows how to do that and I can talk to and express in human terms what I want. Uh I think more than anything what you're going to see is you know the internet changed our lives in a lot of ways. It the num we didn't need the number of secretaries, we had productivity went up. There were people who lost their jobs, but it wasn't like entire industries were wiped out. And I think what AI is going to do is more than destroy industries like the accounting industry. I mean, two ledger accounting is pretty easy and it's pretty easy for a machine to know every single law on the books and, and to be able to calculate every legal loophole. You're not going to need a ton of accountants, but you are still going to need some accountants and you're going to need somebody who understands the nuances of, of changing laws and how they might be interpreted and affected. And yes. you need somebody to oversee the machine and make sure the machine is calculating things correctly. So what you're going to see is these, these massive industries diminish. And the question is, where do all those people go? And it was a question that Reagan was posed in the 1980s when he got into office. He said, where are all these new jobs going to come from? And Reagan just said, I don't know, but I know that if we, if we provide the, I can't remember how he actually phrased it, but it was like, Hey, if we, if we give companies the latitude to invent and do R and D that the jobs will show up and they did, they showed up in, you know, over the next 20 years. And then with the advent of the internet, the same thing happens. So I think that, I think a, the, the, the fear mongering around AI is way overhyped. And I think we're far better off learning how to increase our own productivity. I think about, now I'm just rambling, but <laughs> let me say one more thing. So I thought about this before from my standpoint, because I, I do a, a solo business. Mm -hmm. Imagine if I had somebody who worked for me that worked 24 hours a day. They read everything I read. They read the stuff I didn't have time to read. They handled all of my scheduling and all of my, uh, all of my stuff. And, the, and they help, uh, they, they help check all the writing that I did to make sure it's phonetical and that it sounds in my voice. And, you know, eventually it might be able to write some stuff for me if I give it some direction. And then I never had to pay that person anything. And they just worked 24 hours a day as an assistant who is basically a carbon copy of me. <laughs> Think of what I could do with that. That's the image that, um, that Microsoft has with their AI assistant. They're, they're talking the, the AI, um, what do they call it? It's like a cohort or something. The assistant, essentially. Somebody who is you, just a digital version of you that can assist with all the stuff you're doing. That's a game changer for people who are trying to do more with less. And it's going to create so much freedom and opportunity for the people who, instead of being scared of it, learn how to harness it and use it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that is the hope, the great hope for AI. Uh, we'll see how close they can actually get to that. Um, but it's, what do you think the timeline is? What do I think the timeline for that AI yeah. is five years? If everything develops. So it's hard to say because AI, if it self iterates, like if it really does start improving itself, that kind of throws out traditional timelines, then we really don't know, but I haven't actually seen it doing that. Like I, I know chat GPT four is way better than chat GPT 3.5, but not, not, it's not revolutionarily different. So yeah. I don't know. It's hard for me to estimate the timeline just because it doesn't seem to be 
I mean, I've been, you know, I've been writing about tech and stuff since like, 2009. I, I did my first tech promo, uh, an investing promo. So I've been looking at this stuff and they've been talking about AI forever. They've been talking about AI since the 80s when I was born. Um, and it just never really seems to show up. Doesn't mean it won't, but I don't, well, I don't know that the Ray Kurzweil, you know, in 2040, the singularity is going to show up is, is actually going to happen. Yeah. So, so you, I, my, my question is, so for anybody who doesn't know, like there's general AI, which we don't have yet. And then there's like more specific AI for tasks. Like you train it on a specific thing and it can do that one thing really well. Are you saying that general artificial intelligence is five years away or, or no, no, that, no, I'm saying, okay. I'm saying that the narrow AI where it can replicate a certain task to perfect human ability is still five years away. I like, I don't see this narrow AI being, it's great. It's useful, but you know, it, I don't know. I tried to have it write an email and I could have written the thing 10 times by the time it took me to edit it. Yeah. That's what I've found is they're like, oh, look at how quickly I, I wrote this in 30 seconds. It's like, yeah, but it took you four hours to figure out the prompts to get it to produce that. Why wouldn't you just write the thing yourself? And then it, it, it for lack of a better term, it doesn't have soul. It doesn't have any real emotional depth behind it. It's just, it's, I don't know if it's because, you know, I studied creative writing in college. I've been writing since I was in high school. I, I, maybe I'm closer to, maybe I see more things in writing than other people do, but I think everybody feels it and it just doesn't feel human yet. And and there's something about humans. We want to interact with humans. We're yeah. never going to just be comfortable with robots. I don't think. Well, yeah, I have a, I have a couple of clients who are in, in the art world. And um, the big question about uh, AI was it in their ability to create art was what it was it going to destroy the art world and, and all the artists would be out of business. And I said, why would you even think it would do that? Wouldn't you think it, it would make human art even more valuable because AI could produce art on mass and just, just massive amounts of this stuff. And I think that's the same thing for content. Everybody's trying to figure out a way to create content faster so that they can get more reach and they can get more followers. And the more they try and produce content, in a, the less valuable that content seems to be. And it's been one of my big complaints is just all of the vapid advice on, on X and on Instagram. Um, and I'm probably guilty of some of that myself, but I, I, I try and make at least what I'm writing somewhat valuable to the reader and, and that they walk away with not just education and entertainment, but also elevation. I think those are the three things that content needs to do. It needs to educate people. It needs to be entertaining and, and it needs to elevate their thinking in some way. Uh, and my goal is to create content like that. I think it's really hard to do that on mass and the more AI Rather than helping us create better content, I think artificial intelligence is just going to help us create more crap yeah. uh, that we then have to sift through. But it's going to make the human information, the human connection, even more valuable than not less. So I think of it like, so say it did perfectly carbon copy your writing style and your experience, and you could just train it. And all of a sudden, you could send 10 emails a day. How many people would read your 10 emails a day? Like there's, there's, there's no scarcity anymore. And even yeah. if it's all of your thoughts, having, you know, people can't process that much information at one time. There's something yeah. cool about reading, you know, a thousand word email and then thinking about it and coming back to like, well, you know, he was talking about in the, the minimalism, the entrepreneurial minimalism. This was a good concept and it stuck in my brain. It took me a while to process. If I had read 10 more articles from you between that and, and this conversation, I mean, how much would I have retained? So I, there's some, some value in the scarcity of being human too. Yeah. Without a doubt, and, and I've written about this before. We we've moved out of we're in an, what I call an age of apathy. It's the worst place to be if you're trying to you know, if you're trying to grow a business in that in the sense that um, people are not they're disinterested. Like it's it, we live in an on demand society now. It used to be in in I called it the age of scarcity. That's not my term. I just don't remember who who pricked it up. I don't want to pretend like I created that, but um, there's an age, this age of scarcity of appointment viewing, you know, you're old enough to remember showing up like Friday nights was TGIF at my house. When I was growing up, uh, it was a string of half hour comedies that were on in the evenings. And there was no way there was no DVR. You just showed up and every, it was appointment viewing to go watch it. And you, now that's all gone. We're in an age of abundance in the age of apathy where people are just like, oh, I'll get that whenever I want to get it. Like it should just yeah. be on demand for me anytime. 
And that sort of apathy is is really difficult. And it goes to it goes to your point about, hey, there's no scarcity anymore in creating. So people try and manufacture it. They, you know, they create I've only got eight copies of my digital right. book. It's like, really? Come on, dude. And and they do all these stupid things to try and motivate people to buy. Uh, when in reality, it's it's getting harder and harder to create that sort of legitimate scarcity in a product. It's It can still be done. So I'm sure you know Dan Kennedy, uh, the kind of copywriter marketing guy. He, I was raised, I learned copywriting from Dan. Yeah. So he still, I mean, he's, I think he's still alive. He had that scare a while ago. Uh, but even to this day, he, the only way to get him is by fax machine. He just doesn't have the internet in his house. He doesn't have a cell phone. And it's really, it fits his personality. But the scarcity of that is what makes him one of the highest paid marketing consultants and copywriters out there because he's legitimately made himself scarce. Uh, and so yeah. you're, you're right. There's a lot of fake scarcity. There's like in the, the calendar booking app I have, it's like it lets you put fake scarcity in there. It's like, how much do you want to seem available? It's like, I know you have all of next week available, but let's make it look like you only have Thursday between 8 a.m. and you know 9 a.m. It's like, no, yeah, I just, it's it's so funny that you say that because I I learned to write. Well, Dan's not the only guy I learned it from, but Dan Dan taught me more about influence, I think, and and uh, and and how to communicate value than better than anybody else. Um, and I've taken multiple courses from him on on that subject. But I don't think that I don't. Uh, this is going to be a sacrilege to some people, but I don't think Dan is is a like the greatest copywriter. He's no. certainly one of the best paid. But I don't know that he's that much better than some of the other guys who you could easily get on the phone for a, for a, a reasonable fee to write your copy. Uh, what he's done an exceptional job of is, as you say, creating legend around himself and and finding a group of people who will just talk about him as though he's the greatest thing that's ever lived. And he does a great job of self-promotion. Um, and, uh, and, and so... He's a great guy to study if any of you haven't studied him. He's, his stuff is still relevant today. As I think any good copywriter, this stuff transcends time It's because it, it, human nature doesn't change. But that's an inter interesting point that you bring up about him is that he makes it difficult to get at. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons he can charge more is because he just makes it real hard. Now, it's tough for a new guy to do that, right? If you're just coming onto the scene you can't very well just be like, yeah, I, you got to, you got to mail me a letter, you know, that's <laughs> more difficult. Yeah. I don't think, you know, Dan didn't start that way either. Like everybody starts somewhere. And then as he built his legend, he, he made himself more scarce and he did it all intentionally. He's a genius at positioning that really, you know, I've been looking at his copywriting stuff since I first started. And I don't know, within like four years, I thought I was a better writer than him, but I wasn't <laughs> nearly as good at positioning things as he is. So there's yeah. a whole lot of skills in copywriting that aren't just putting the words on the page. Um, yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. Um, and I, I just think, again, you know, this far, you will know this far better than me and could probably speak better to it. But I think that it's just, it's not as difficult a skill to learn as you might think. There are some templates, there are some formulas for writing that can, they can get you a lot of the way there. And, and I, I, I say, if you just spend an hour a day for 30 days, just copying sales letters, it's more about understanding, um, the understanding what's tr what you're trying to accomplish and overcoming the objections and in creating the, the, uh, the urgency, uh, than it is necessarily the words you write. And, and, and even Dan would admit this. He said, the list is more important than the copy. Yeah. He said, you can write really bad copy. If it's going to the right group of people, it'll perform well. You take great copy and put it in front of the wrong people, you don't sell anything. So yeah, the only the only time you need to have top, top skills of copywriting is when you're spending millions of dollars on cold traffic. And and every single syllable matters, you know, to those campaigns. Um, but for most people, building the type of business that you're promoting, you need to bond with your audience. You need to build an audience and bond with them more than anything else. And then it's, you can just say, Hey, I have this new thing. Do you want to buy it? Like when I launched How do you my, teach people how to do that? To bond with their audience? Yeah. How do you, are you teaching social media marketing at all? I mean, how no, do you, how do I, they do outreach? Uh, I mean, I teach live networking, like for freelancers, when you only need a couple clients, uh, there's email follow-up systems where you're, you're reaching out with valuable content, but you're, you're getting the best way is referrals from other freelancers. So having a network of freelancers is actually more important than having a network of clients because say I'm working on a copy project and I say, Oh, I want my friend, you know, uh, Lynn to design this piece. 
or do the design for this. They're going to hire them. They're not even going to ask questions. So having that network of people that you can share clients with, because there's so much out there. Um, when, when, when you get a client that hires freelancers, they're going to hire more than one. Mm -hmm. So that's typically the best way. I don't do social media much myself. Like I'm kind of a stalker on X or Twitter or whatever it's called now. Uh, yeah. I, I tweet every once in a while, but I deleted Instagram because I just, I was wasting too much time staring at other people's lives. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, this is not adding any value to my life. And I, I stay on Facebook to follow family, but I, I don't do much social media stuff. I just, yeah. I go on podcasts. Uh, I release my own podcast. I build my email list that way. And email communication for me is, is everything. Just so then do you create, do you help create the network for your clients then as they come in? Do you have like pools of people that are in kind of like a community you built or do yeah you just teach we have the breaking free community where i you know i do a live stream there once a month answer questions and we try to to help each other out it's hey i have i want to pitch a client this what, what how's this sound um so there's some some feedback there uh mostly building up our, our mobile money skill stacks is like how do i phrase the statement how do i do my viral pitch can you give me some feedback on this uh so that's more where i i work with those the uh customers Got it. Yeah. I, uh, I, I teach, a um, I teach, so I teach content marketing mostly for, for my clients, but I, like you said, I don't spend, when I go on social media, it's for work. Like, so I'm not there to be entertained. I'm not there to figure to see what my friends are doing. I don't spend much time on Instagram either. Uh, I'm, I'm there to produce content or respond to people so that I can build my audience and, and build my reach. And I think that's a, when, when you realize that, hey, social media, you're a net producer, not a net consumer, it kind of changes the way you look at it. But um, I've always been interested in people who have referral businesses because I get referral people all the time, but I have never focused on referral traffic as a as a major source for generating leads and, and generating clients. And it's it's a fascinating concept to me. I think as anything is when you don't do much of it. So you're kind of like, well, how, how do you do that? That's like really interesting to me. Um, so then when you have clients that are sat, that are satisfied uh, and, and they're singing your praises and maybe they even leave you a testimonial, is there a way, a process that you use to reach out and say, hey, do you know of anybody? That's always felt like an awkward conversation to me. Like, so you know anybody else who might need work from me? For you talk about for the copywriting business or for the well, my new kind of venture? Whichever one you choose. Like, I just want to know if there's a if how if, if you do that and if so, how that is done. Uh, with copywriting, it was, I got referrals from just other freelancers almost entirely. It's like, oh, hey, you need Henry for this. Um, or I would speak at an event and then somebody would email me afterwards. Um, but I, you know, I kept my client list down to like three or four people that I worked with at a time, almost always. I just don't, you know, when you're doing a lot of big projects, I had big retainers, like 20K a month, somebody's paying you to not work with any other financial publishers. And then you could do some health stuff on the side and maybe some personal development or consulting here and there. Um, but mostly it's just if I ever lost a client, I had 10 people that had been wanting to work with me for years that was just on the back burner. I got sent out an email and said, hey, I have a spot. And it was nice. just from meeting people at live events, having conversations at the bar um, and networking, just having that network of, of freelancers and, and people in the industry. Is that a natural thing for you? I am. I, I know I probably yeah. seem like a bit of an extrovert. I'm. I'm super introverted, and I struggle when I go to events to to do that sort of networking. So it's actually funny. I'm a, very much an introvert. I I can put on a show when I'm out in public, but then I come back and sleep for three days. Like I need yeah, to decompress. Yeah, me too. But it's funny because I have a friend visiting right now, uh, Marcella Allison, uh, and she she's a great copywriter. She's worked under uh, Paris Lampropoulos, if you know him for years. Mm. Um, she is a super extrovert. So the I met her in 2010, I think, at a, a John Carlton copywriting thing. Uh, and she just, I, I made friends with her and then she just drug me around. She introduced me to David Deutsch, to Paris, to like John Carlton, to all these people. And then I got two clients at that one event just from her dragging me around saying, have you seen this guy? Have you met this guy? This is Henry. You should know Henry. And she's just a super connector. So I like to find if you're an introvert, I like to find that one extrovert, make one friend, and all of a sudden you have 10. Yeah. It's so funny. Um, I David and I are, are now acquaintances. We're linked up on um online on, on X. And I've been fo I've followed him for a long time. And I I I think he's an incredible copywriter. And it's it's so funny because I 
I get the weirdest. I used to live in Los Angeles and I'm, I'm not one to geek out on celebrities at all. Like it's not a, it's not a big deal to me. My wife, on the other hand, any B or C list reality TV star she sees, she falls apart over. Um, but it's funny because when he followed me, when he followed me on, uh, on X, I was giddy. I told him, I showed my wife, I'm like, he's, he's, a, he's one of the greatest copywriters alive today. And he followed me. <laughs> He thinks what I say has value. It's just funny that the things that kind of the nerdy world that we live in. He's he's a really funny guy. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. I, I've i done this charity stuff uh, with a couple friends of mine where, you know, go hang out with Paul Rudd and Jason Sudeikis. And none of those guys ever really impressed me. And then the first time I hung out in person with Tom Woods, whose podcast I really like, I was just, I don't know what it was. I was nervous for no good reason. Yeah. It's, it's Tom Woods. He has a, you know, he's a big audience, but it's not like yeah. he's an A-list celebrity that everybody would know. But it's <laughs> like, because I had admired the, you know, I thought he was really brave during the COVID stuff. I really like his messaging. He's got great books. I was just tripping over my words, felt like an idiot. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So let's go back. Cause I want to ask you about, uh, about the, the introverted stuff then. So yeah. What is your is your goal to cling? Because my wife's super extroverted, which is nice. Because when we go out, she drags me around and introduces me, and we yeah. meet people. Is do you need somebody like that when you go to stuff, or do you just figure out a? Do you just oh, just push all that shit down deep and just go? I I mean I can do either. I can talk to people. Um, I, I'm not shy, uh, so I I will go up and talk to people, but I don't I don't like initiating conversation. I actually have to like mentally prepare for it. Yeah. Um, but then I find I typically if I'm going to an event, I'll know there's one or two people I want to talk to. And I'll make sure to make those connections. Um, no matter how awkward it makes me feel. And then What's your... go ahead. Yeah, you know, anything else that that happens to come from that I'm I'm okay with. But What's normally your favorite it's, event yeah. to attend? My favorite event to attend? Yeah. Do you have a list that you go every year? Like I do traffic and conversion almost every year. I thought about going to that. Um, you know, it's funny. I my favorite events are the ones held by my friends. So Kevin Rogers, copy chief events. I love going to. Okay. Um, I, I've been going to AWAI's copywriting thing since 2009, I think was the really? first one. And so I've okay. met some, you know, it's funny because I was just an attendee and then I've spoken at it twice since then. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have a list that I go to every year anymore, especially since yeah. COVID shut everything down and people stopped having live events. I'm I'm trying to get back into them, but mostly I just go to hang out with my friends now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Oh man, that's awesome. What about you? You said traffic conversion. Is there anything else you like to to go to? That's the big one that I go to all the time. And then um I I like the marketing the, the digital marketing stuff. I don't know that I've ever been to a copywriting one. I've been to a, a couple of the ones Dan Kennedy ran for yeah. years. I would go to those. Uh, mainly because I just like hearing because Dan Kennedy stuff, it's all pitch. There's very, it's all like 45 minutes of, of some pseudo content and then mm -hmm. buy my stuff. Uh, I like watching those. And so I'll go and, and listen to some of these people give their pitches and, and they, he brings out some legends. And so I, as I said, since about 2020, I haven't gone to very many because I like you have just focused in other directions, but those are, uh, uh those are the two that I went to regularly. And then, Sometimes in Los Angeles, they'll just have weird stuff. So when I lived out there, if they had something that there was going on, I just, I'd shoot over and check it out. Yeah. But most of them are, are digital marketing stuff. Yeah. They, when I show up to things now, it's typically part of a mastermind. So I'm in Tom Woods, uh, high end mastermind. Now I was in baby bathwater for a while. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's a, no. it's a cool, it's, it's don't throw the, the baby out with the bathwater, but it's a cool curated group of entrepreneurs and once a year, they run out a private Island in Croatia for five days. And so you just go hang out there with a bunch of you know, there's some real legendary entrepreneurs in that group. Um, so th I like the the more curated events rather than the go here to learn something events. Mm -hmm. Like where there's, yeah. when there's a bunch of speakers, it just feels like, I don't know, man, I'll watch your course online or I'll watch you on YouTube. I don't need to show up in person. So yeah, I, sure. I go for the networking for things. So what is Th Tom Woods has a high level mastermind? What does he teach? Uh, so he brings in, a, it's a lot of people that are it's a fascinating group of people, actually. Uh, there's a guy with a billion dollar real estate portfolio. You know, I have my Practical Liberty, uh, huge accounting firm, uh, a guy that has a, a giant uh, equipment rental business. It's just a bunch of interesting entrepreneurs. Um, and we just get together. We have a, a Discord uh, chat going and, or sorry, a Signal chat going. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's it's business skills, but uh, mostly people that are trying to launch and grow online versions of their their current business or just scale oh, up their, their current business. Huh. Wait, how many times how often do you guys meet? Uh, so we had our first, it's, it's only been going for, I think, four months now. We had one in-person meeting in New York City a couple of weeks ago. We have another one coming up in uh, October and then another one February, I think. So three in-person and then just monthly uh, online stuff. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, I've uh, I had one high level mastermind years ago, and I've always thought about doing another one. I I like there are things I really like about them. Like I like getting everybody together. I like having you know being able to uh, share ideas with really smart people. I just I don't like I was in I was in uh, um, Perry Belcher's and uh, and Ryan Dice's war room for a number of years. Okay. And it was a great, I, I, I loved going and it was fun to go rub elbows with guys who had $50 million companies and, and learn what they knew and, and, and get to meet those guys. And like you said, there's a, there's a bit of status to that, but it was like, at the end of the year, it was a $50,000 bill. And I was just, yeah. I go, eh, I mean, eh, yeah. And then I got, I got to fly down there and I got to hang out. It's like, it became too much. Um, and anytime I've thought about starting one up, I'm like, in order to make it what I would want it, you're going to have to charge thirty, forty thousand dollars a head to make it, you know, because you got to pay to put people or pay, pay for the space when people fly and you got to do something fun with them. And yeah. I was just like, ah, I just been putting it off. And that's why I asked what Tom Woods was doing because it surprises mm -hmm. me that he would have a high level mastermind. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know. It, it came out of his school of life program, basically. I mean, I don't know if you've seen him launch that. Yeah. I've seen but, it. Uh, yeah, so he had a bunch of people in there. He saw, oh, I have a bunch of people that have done well in business. Um, and so we had Marlon Sanders, the he's one of the OG internet marketers. Um, he came and talked to us for a couple of days at that in-person event. Um, so it, I don't know. It's I really like the networking part of it. Um, yeah. So I've 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 enjoyed it. Uh, I still like it because it's still small. It's brand new. I mean, I don't mean I still like it. I like it because it's still very small. So very intimate. Um, those tend to be better than Baby Bathwater was a couple hundred people at, at one point, and I was just like. Too many people to meet can't keep up with it. And yeah, that was that's when I left War Room was when they made the expansion. So they had about fifteen people in it when I joined, and and then they decided, hey, you know, we could add a couple of extra zeros for not much extra work. Just open it up to a hundred people instead of fifteen, and, and that's when I took off. It was like this is this is now just a, a gigantic group of people. Yeah, it changes the nature of it. Yeah, I, I understand from a business perspective, but. Um, well, that's what I told Ryan when I left because he, he he was trying to convince me to stay. And I said, "Listen, man, I I yeah, like I am I'm just a casualty of you all's success because there are a ton of people who want in, and you got to do it from a business perspective. It makes a lot of sense." But I said, "That's just not. I'm not looking for. I'm not looking for a room of 200 people. I, I was looking for intimate somebody yeah. I could have longer conversations with." Um, well, we've been going for almost an hour and a half now, and. Uh... <laughs> I have more calls. I'm sure you have a busy day as well. So I really appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, JasonStapleton.com. I'll put the links in the bio. I read your newsletter every week when it comes out. I, I highly recommend it that people jump on that list. Um, and well, this you. was a great conversation. It was great getting to know you. Yeah, it, yeah, really great getting to know you, man. All right, we'll keep in touch, I'm sure. Yep. All right, see you, everybody. Hey, if you thought that video was good, please click the like button and don't forget to subscribe. It really helps me out. Thanks. Mm -hmm.